St. Benedict said in his rule that the life of a monk should be a continuous Lent. 2020 has been a continuous Lent. 2021 is beginning that way. What St. Benedict meant when he said the life of a monk should be a continuous Lent is, and I'll read it to you actually, is he was saying that we should spend every bit of our life in a sense of self-denial and discipline for the purpose of uniting ourselves with the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight, and I want to talk a little bit about why Lent is important and why oftentimes we, we enter this season with all the great intentions, but we never really are able to uh, live up to what we want to do, what we think we should do, and how oftentimes we, we, we really miss the mark as to how we should be spending, um, spending our Lenten disciplines. Let me read to you what St. Benedict says about the observance of Lent. I don't think he says anything at all about the observance of Easter or Advent or any other season. He says, the life of a monk ought at all times to be Lenten in its character. But since few have the strength for that, we therefore urge that in these days of Lent, the brethren should lead lives of great purity and should also in this sacred season expiate the negligences of other times. This will worthily be done if we refrain from all sin and apply ourselves to prayer with tears, to reading, to compunction of heart, and to, ab and to abstinence. In these days, therefore, let us add something beyond the wanton measure of our service, such as private prayers and abstinence in food and drink. But each one, over and above the measure prescribed for him, offer God something of his own free will in the joy of the Holy Spirit. That is to say, let him stint himself of food, drink, sleep, talk, and jesting, and look forward with the joy of spiritual longing to the holy feast of Easter. And let it be done with his consent and blessing, because what is done without the permission of the spiritual father shall be ascribed to presumption and vainglory and not reckoned meritorious. Everything, therefore, is to be done with the approval of the abbot. Now, let me explain a couple of things about this. Let me first address who cares what St. Benedict wrote. St. Benedict is, in many ways, one of the great founders of, of Western Christianity in terms of spirituality. He lived in the sixth century in the 500s, um, and if if you live in the 6th century, in the 500s, and you live in, in the Western part of the world, what is the one great event that was occurring in the 500s, if you remember from, from your world history, that was going on that Benedict had to deal with? Any thoughts in the 500s? In Italy, what was happening? Jeff? Was was it the fall of the Roman Empire? It was the fall of the Roman Empire. Absolutely. Kind of like the, the final blow. I mean, the, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire didn't happen overnight. But this is where, where Western civilization, as it had been established with great glory for such a long time, was now coming to an end. To live in a time when the world established seemed to be crumbling. We may be able to find some parallels and how we feel sometimes that things around us are crumbling away and how things used to be no longer are. And so what Benedict did is that he retreated and founded really through trial and error this school of the Lord's service. Of what does it mean to love the Lord and to serve him? And so he is not the founder of monasticism, but certainly he is the father of Western monasticism. And when I say Western, I mean Latin. European and not Greek Russian monasticism. Okay, that's in the sixth century. When Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury during the time of, of Henry VIII and Edward VI, composed, compiled 
the first book of common prayer in 1549. You've, you've heard me say this a trillion times before. He took all of the monastic rhythm of life, which is praying eight times a day, seven during the day and one at midnight. And Cranmer collapsed them into two, being morning prayer and evening prayer. The genius of it is that it was no longer in the um, no longer the the sole province of monks and nuns, but it was now given to everybody to to lay people and clergy alike. It is the book of common prayer, not separate books and devotions for monastics and separate books and devotions for laity everybody. But he drew upon the eight times of prayer that Benedict established and um, has given the Anglican tradition a very distinct Benedictine character in how we pray. Now, um, if you ever came to an evening prayer at St. Timothy's when we could do that in person, we always read a portion from the rule of St. Benedict every night. If you ever listen to the evening prayer podcast that I do on Apple Podcasts and other places, we, I will read a portion from um, the rule of St. Benedict, partly because it's good spiritual reading to do, like this beautiful passage on Lent. And also, it's, it's wonderful to discover that the way he ordered morning prayer or evening prayer, like Vespers, for instance, is exactly the way we still do it in 2021. So what he wanted us to do in the early 6th century is exactly the way we do it all these hundreds of years later. So it's a powerful reminder of the continuity between Benedict um, so long ago and us now. But talking about Lent, so we have that character in our tradition, and he is a, he's a, he's a pivotal character in our tradition. But listen again to what he says, that the life of a, of a, of a Christian, we can take the word monk and make it Christian should be Lenten in its character, but since so few have the strength for that, Benedict is always very good at setting up what is the ideal, but then always giving pastoral um, consolations or concessions for the weakness of the flesh. Then since we can't do it with the same intensity our entire life, we should, during these period of 40 days, quadragesima, these 40 days, lead lives of great purity and expiate the negligences of other times, make up, um, atone for other times when we have been very lax in our faith. This is a time to be renewed, to start over. The church gives us every single year an excuse, an opportunity to do the things that we know we need to do. And the beauty is we're all called to do it together. So the, the, the difficulty in going at it alone is not there because all of us are called to lead lives like this. So if you ever wanted to fast, for instance, but you knew if you were to start fasting or abstaining from certain foods and then um, you're the only one doing it, it's gonna be very difficult. It's like trying to diet in a house where no one else is dieting. It is really, really hard to do, um, almost impossible, except for those who have a unique character of strength of will. So we're all in this together. All of us are in this together. Um, this will be worthily done if we refrain from all sin and apply ourselves to prayer with tears, to really mean it, to reading, you know, reading spiritual things to compunction of heart. We don't use that word very often. How would you define compunction? Break down the word and tell me what you think it means in the pieces. I'm hearing compound or double increase or, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. William said impulse. Okay. Compound. Any other thoughts? What's the prefix uh, COM usually mean? Is it with? With, yeah, with. And then punction. 
a puncture with a wound. Compunction of heart is to, is to have, uh, to be wounded. These powerful images of, of Cupid, right? Cupid is the image of compunction. The arrow, I cross my heart and hope to die kind of thing. So it's just to, to be, to, to feel, to, to open ourselves and be vulnerable. Um, compunction of heart, uniting our sufferings with the sufferings of Jesus, which we'll talk to. And to abstinence. Now, let's talk about the word abstinence. Abstinence, in almost every term in which we, we, we hear it, is usually refraining from, from sexual activity. Benedict was writing to monks. That was a foregone conclusion, ideally. So by abstinence, he's not talking about sexual activity. He's talking about foods and other things. But certainly food and drink is what he's talking about. Um, and he even elaborates on that by saying, let us add something beyond. You know, sometimes in Lenten disciplines, when we talk about the things we're called to give up, people may say, you know what, instead of giving something up, let me add something. I'm going to address that. But Benedict already has. Benedict says we do both. We give something up, food and drink, but we also add something. Um, we add additional prayers to our devotion. And then in our modern context, we would also add almsgiving, charitable works and giving above and beyond what is our normal rule of life. Now, he didn't say almsgiving to the, to the monks because they had no money. They were, they were impoverished and they were the recipient of people who um, gave alms. Let each one over and above the measure prescribed to him offer God something of his own free will in the joy of the Holy Spirit, which means to, to do Lent means we need to make a decision for ourselves and not simply do it because we're told to do it with no participation of our will. That's not a spiritual discipline. That's just following a rule for the sake of following a rule. Now, the church gives us guidelines and gives us standards to follow to help us so we can do it together, but we need to voluntarily want to do this so that we may, by having things scrubbed away and denying a part of ourselves, may come to know the power of Jesus all the more. And then the other thing, which is really very contemporary, I think, is that Benedict is saying what we need to take on and what we need to give up needs to be done in consultation with a spiritual elder. Now, in the monastic context, he's talking about the abbot. And he says, do this so that um, so we, sh we shall not fall into presumption or vain glory. The reason why I say this is a very contemporary issue is that oftentimes, once people discover something about Lenten disciplines, then it becomes the opposite of what we have in Matthew chapter 6, which is the gospel for Ash Wednesday. We start parading around what we're doing and how pious we are and what we're giving up, what we're taking on. And we, um, we, we take pictures of our, of our good works and the ashes on our foreheads and all the things that completely do the opposite of what is intended, not to draw attention to ourselves but to deny ourselves so that my own pride in my personality is, is stripped away so that all that exists within me is the Holy Spirit, the life of Jesus, and that he lives in me and I live in him. And the wisdom that is 1,500 years old from Benedict is contem as contemporary today as it was then. The thing about having a little bit of pain a little bit of suffering. And when I'm talking about pain and suffering in our life, we have to chuckle a bit at how really relative it all is. We're talking about giving up a little bit of food. We're talking about giving up a little bit of drink. We're not talking about anything that really is extraordinary and extravagant. We're talking about doing just a little bit. And what ends up happening is that becomes very, very hard. And um, we struggle with it. And so we're given a very, very light yoke to carry on us. And we end up not being able to, to follow through on it. That's my experience. The things that I do, um, I end up failing every single time. 
where I really want to, where I always go into limp, you know, I'm going to live this austere Benedictine monastic thing where I'm going to eat grass and air for the next 40 days. And I may put a, you know, I'll drink water and I'm feeling really, really extravagant. I'll put a piece of ice in there. Nah, I don't do that at all. I start out wanting to do that, but then my flesh is so weak. My willpower is so frail. Some wonderful individual brought a bag of white chocolate covered Oreos with with red sprinkles on them for Valentine's Day to give to the officers in the St. Michael Chapel. The poor officers never, ever saw them because they were sitting in our office and we devoured them and they were so good and I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. I want to talk um, a little bit about the origins of Lent to understand what the purpose is. I'm going to share a screen of um, 1662 Book of Common Prayer. If you were not able to come to church on Ash Wednesday, I recorded with Robert and Kristen singing Psalm 51, this ancient liturgy called a commination or, as the title says, denouncing of God's anger and judgments against sinners, with certain prayers to be used on the first day of Lent, and at other times as the ordinary, the bishop shall appoint. Remember that um, there is in the, in, the, in the official books of common prayer in the Church of England, and there have been, th um, there have been three 1549, 1552, 1559, and 1662, never has there been the imposition of ashes. It's been called Ash Wednesday, but the ashes were banned uh, in 1547 by, by the Privy Council under the rule of Edward VI. Look how the liturgy begins. Brethren, in the primitive church, there was a godly discipline that at the beginning of Lent, such persons as stood convicted of notorious sin. Every time you see an F, you have to do an S at the beginning. Not notorious fin, but notorious sin. Were put to open penance and punished in this world that their souls might be saved in the day of the Lord and that others admonished by their example might be the more afraid to offend. So that's the first paragraph, and then we go to there are our current liturgy of Ash Wednesday, where we, we really water it down. Dear people of God, the first Christians observe with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection, and it became the custom uh, of the church to prepare for them by a season of penitence and fasting. This season of Lent provided a time in which converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism, and now we get into the 1662. It was also a time when those who, because of notorious sins, had been separated from the body of the faithful were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to the fellowship of the church, thereby the whole congregation was put in mind of the message of pardon and absolution. A bit more gentle in the sense that um, people who were convicted of notorious sin were, were um, expelled from the church so that they might do public penance for their own soul, but also to serve as a warning to other people not to, not to, commit, um, not to commit these sins, especially these notorious sins. And then the beauty of it, this sounds really, really harsh and horrible. I mean, it even goes down in the next paragraph. Instead, whereof, until the said discipline may be restored again, which is much to be wished. Even in 1662 and earlier, they were hoping we would have this medieval practice of kicking people out on Ash Wednesday. We have to have the full context in mind. They were expelled from the church with a powerful liturgy on Ash Wednesday in sackcloth and ashes, but they were restored to the church on Monday, Thursday. And I think there's something to be, to be gathered from this idea that we come and recognize our mortality, our brokenness, thou art dust and dust thou shalt return. And then we spend this season 
in reflection and prayer and almsgiving and, um, and fasting to mortify our flesh so that we may be united to Jesus Christ. So when we come back for the Paschal Mysteries, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, the Great Vigil of Easter, we understand the season and the, and the, and the meaning of reconciliation and the, the, the medieval liturgy of welcoming people back into the church there was, um, it's, it's not online any longer. They took it down. I don't know why. But some scholars in the UK and priests did a wonderful reenactment of the Monday Thursday liturgy in which the penitents were welcomed back. And it's, it was beautiful. They were, they were outside the church, literally outside, and they were kneeling, and the priest would come to the door and would sing in Latin, come, come, venite. And they would come and they would kneel and the priest would say, levate, and they would raise and come. And there's this, we don't do in our modern times, this public act of reconciliation. We're good at canceling people and we're good at damning people. We're horrific at restoring people. And that was a powerful, powerful thing that was embedded naturally into into the church. But the point I want to make is, is that we are all um, we all should be outside on Ash Wednesday because of our life. But then to be restored and received back in. And it's that kind of grace and forgiveness that that I think we don't think we deserve and we don't really understand because we don't know how to demonstrate that. And we can't demonstrate that to others because we don't think we're worthy to receive it ourselves. Of course, we're not worthy of our own merits to receive it. That's not the point. We're worthy to receive it because Christ has, he lives within us and he makes us worthy to receive it. So there is this very interesting duality to this season of where we really are kind of beating ourselves up mainly because for the rest of the year, we falsely build ourselves up. And this element of truth and really looking honestly at ourselves is something that's sore needed, but that's not where it ends. It's not, it's not pointless self-flagellation. We do it so that we may better understand the goodness of God's grace. I mean, why are we so unwilling to admit our brokenness and sin? It's because I think we believe that if we are truly honest, then we'll never be offered forgiveness and reconciliation. That's just simply nonsense. Why do we lie to ourselves and assume that God doesn't know the truth about us? And that's one of the mistakes we make in prayer is that we try to pretend that we're something that we're not in prayer. And that's why prayer is oftentimes fruitless for us because we're, we're not being honest. We're holding back as if God doesn't already know. I have a question, Father Steve, it's Amy. Um, why was that great um, reconciliation done on Monday, Thursday? Why that day? I would have thought maybe it was maybe Good Friday or even Easter. Why Monday, Thursday? Um, I'm going to do a little bit of guessing. And because Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and the Great Vigil of Easter are three distinct liturgies, but they really constitute one organic whole. And if you've, of course, Amy, you have, you've been to Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and the Great Vigil, and you know how, for instance, Good Friday picks up exactly where Monday Thursday left off. And in, a, and in a way, the Easter Vigil picks up where Good Friday left off. So if you're going to be reconciled to Easter, you have to first be brought into the power of Monday Thursday, which is where also, that is where we celebrate the institution of the Holy Eucharist, the institution of the priesthood, and we associate the institution of the priesthood on Monday, Thursday, not because Jesus said at the Last Supper, um, guess what, you're all now bishops and priests. It's because he breathed on them the Holy Spirit and said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. 
so the dual nature of the priesthood um, is um, not the dual nature, but priests are called to offer sacrifice and to absolve. And so to be to be restored on Monday, Thursday, to receive the sacrament, because the Holy Eucharist is the great sacrament of reconciliation. That's why, um, that's why the prayer book tells us, and, and the Christian tradition tells us, the church tradition tells us, that if we have a notorious sinner who is unrepentant, then it is our, it is, is the priest's obligation to, for their own, for their own soul, to not allow them to receive communion. It doesn't say that for any other sacrament. It doesn't say it for confirmation or unction or, or marriage or anything else, but, but the Holy Eucharist, because the Holy Eucharist is the great sacrament of healing and reconciliation. And then after that, of course, um, to then enter into the great Paschal mystery. Paschal is a word coming from Passover, which is a, which is a, a broad term that speaks of the, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So when you hear the, like the Paschal candle, the Paschal mystery, the Paschal rites, it's one of those $2 words that we use all the time, but rarely perhaps define. That's what that means. Pasch, uh, Pascha, as the Greeks um, call it, comes from Passover. Remember, Passover is when the angel passed over the Hebrews if they had the blood over their door from the sacrificed lamb. Bring that to the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the Paschal Passover lamb. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, and through his blood we are delivered from slavery and bondage into freedom. So that would be my most educated guess, Amy, as to why it was done on, on Monday, Thursday. Any other thoughts or questions before we go into some specifics about what we do during Lent. Okay. Again, I can't see you all at one time. So if you have something, just holler. I've said this so many times, I don't want to be repetitive, but we forget. Let's talk about the power and symbolism of 40, quadragesima. If someone were to come to you and say, I understand the Bible makes use of numbers a lot. Um, why 40? What does 40 mean? Why is that significant? And if we understand a bit of the biblical significance of 40, we might understand a bit more of what the hope is for us during this period. The Jews wanders, wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. It just, it just appears multiple times throughout scripture. And what else? Different occurrences. Give me all the 40s you've got. Um, 40 weeks gestation. For yeah, I'm going to come back to that one. That's my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days. And is that what you're going to say, Amy? I'm sorry. Take it. I won't say it anymore. Took it over. Oh. <laughs> you said it. Yeah, Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days. And yeah. 40 nights, yeah. And 40 nights, yep, yep. Yep. Here's an obscure one for you. David reigned for 40 years. Another one that's a bit obscure that we see in, I think, First Peter, or one of the letters of Peter actually defines this, is the life cycle of Moses. From zero to 40, Moses was a prince of Egypt. From 40 to 80, he was uh, uh, keeping his father-in-law's sheep in Midian. And then from 80 to 120, Moses was the, the deliverer of the Hebrew people from Egypt to the, to, the, to the promised land. So if you're feeling like you're looking for retirement and you're looking to take it easy, remember Moses, who really didn't get going until he was 80. And then rested when he died at 120. Now, do we really think that uh, Moses lived to be 120? I think the official church answer is we don't really care. It doesn't really matter uh, exactly if he lived to be 75 or 55 or 120. The point is, is he had three profound periods of his life. And every one of those periods was a transformative period um, that brought about that brought about um, new life. And so what, what Shannon said about gestation is my favorite 
is that typically 40 weeks, nine months is how long it takes us to become fully developed in the womb of our mother. So new life. I think if you understand that's how long gestation is, it then you can apply it to every single one of those moments of 40, from 40 days and 40 nights to Moses on Mount Sinai to 40 years in the wilderness to um, Jesus's 40 days in, in the wilderness being tempted to even David reigning for 40 years and the three periods of Moses um, living um, three periods of 40 years. They all have, um, have an element of birth or new life on the other end. So that being said, this is our embryonic development stage during Lent so that on Easter we can be born or renew that birth. Certainly on the Easter Vigil, because the Easter Vigil, as our prayer book tells us, is, is the time of baptism and the renewal of baptism. So when that font is in there, we all will be renewed like lions, where the faith is roared into us and we come alive. We don't rebaptize ourselves because baptism is an act of God. God doesn't, God doesn't, doesn't need to have his acts repeated or his promises repeated, but we need to remember them again and renew them again. And so that's what we do every time we make the sign of the cross, every time we renew our baptismal vows, every time we go through this season, we remember what has happened and we renew it. It becomes new again to us. We don't have to repeat the act. We just renew it. We remember it. Okay. All right. Let's talk about, um, I want to talk about fasting, almsgiving, and prayer. And I want to talk about, um, just give some specifics on this, because I want you to have a bit of a theological, historical, biblical foundation. But oftentimes, what we really want to know is, how do we do it if we've never done it before? So we'll give you some practical um, tidbits. I think the bare minimum of what we should do during Lent is fast on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday if we're between the ages of 18 and 65. If you're seven, you shouldn't do it. If you're 74, you shouldn't do it. Um, the church has built in understanding of of um, strength. If you have medical conditions that make that very difficult, you shouldn't do it. This is the part where it needs to be, you know, of your own free will, but also understanding the, the purpose of it. Fasting is hard, and it's not meant to be, and again, I've said this a hundred times, but I'll say it again. It's not meant to be a day without any food at all. That, I think, would be dangerous to recommend. Fasting is to drastically reduce the amount of food you eat. The modern definition of what a fast is is to have one small, simple meal during the day, and then two smaller meals or snacks that if you were to combine the two smaller meals, they do not equal the quantity of the one simple meal. So for instance, for me on Ash Wednesday, I had a bowl of um, instant oatmeal at six, 120 calories. I had a bowl of tomato soup with a piece of bread. And then at um, dinner time, I had another bowl of instant oatmeal. I was ready to set my alarm at 12.01 a.m. to go and raid the kitchen. It's hard, absolutely hard. Drank a lot of coffee, drank a lot of tea um, to keep the stomach full. It's distracting, I was, I was irritable. And what that reminds us is even though that was probably, especially the, the bread and the tomato soup, probably maybe a thousand calories, which is not a lot, but certainly not starving, is that I couldn't even do that without really being thrown off my game. That's how weak my flesh is. Um, we want our will to control our bodies and not our bodies to control our will. Meditate on that for a little bit and think about all the difficulties that we have in the world today. Um, oftentimes, our impulses are not governed. Me Too movement is all about the body dominating the will and not the will dominating the body. 
there's no governance of impulses and actions. We are run rampant, run amok with our inability to, to control ourselves. And if we can't even curb our food for one day, it shows us how weak we are. The point is not to say, you stink. The point is to say, I need you, Lord Jesus. I need your grace. Help me. This is hard. So that's Good Friday and Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Put it in order. The other, that's the minimum to do. And this is all prayer book stuff. Prayer book calls us to do this. At the, I mean, if you want to know where, um, it calls us to do these things on page um, 17. Under days of special devotion. Um, where it calls us to have special acts of discipline and self-denial. It doesn't say fast, but it says special acts of discipline and self-denial. Um, abstinence is to give up a particular kind of food. I, um, about three years ago, gave up flesh meat on Fridays throughout the entire year. Again, that's what the prayer book tells us. The prayer book says, Good Friday and all other Fridays in, of the year and commemoration of the Lord's crucifixion, except for Fridays in the Christmas and Easter seasons, and any feasts of our Lord which occur on a Friday are days of special devotion to be observed by acts of discipline and self-denial. That's on page 17 in the prayer book. So I do no flesh meat on all Fridays, which means no steak, no beef, it's fish. Harris Teeter on Friday by my house puts out... Um, um, grilled shrimp in the little section every Friday for people to do that. Every Friday they do that, not just for me. And that's my lunch. I'll get some, some shrimp. Um, so if I'm used to doing that every Friday, I probably should maybe do it on another day, maybe Wednesday, Wednesday and Friday. Why are Wednesdays and Fridays the traditional fasting days in the church? There is a theological reason and a practical reason. Any guesses? I've talked about this before maybe years ago, so I won't be offended if you don't remember. The DDK said that we fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Why? Becky, you were unmuting yourself, but then you muted yourself back. Slippery finger? Yeah, yeah, I didn't mean to unmute, me. I unmute yeah. myself, sorry. All right. Let's put Luke Klingstead on the spot. Luke, do you have any idea? I mean, Friday is for the crucifixion, but I don't know. I don't know why you would do Wednesday. Here's the spiritual reason. It's Wednesday because that was the day that Jesus was betrayed. Oh, Amy McFerrin yet again. I, wow. I, I looked this up recently. This is, yeah, so yeah. it's fresh in my mind. <laughs> he gets the Linton gold star. That's the spiritual reason. The practical reason or the real reason, and this is in the, I think this is in the, this is in the, um, it's either in the DDK or it's in um, the Apostolic Constitution. I think it's in the DDK. Is the pagans would fast on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So the church decided we're going to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays to be different. That's, that's a real practical reason, but, but you're right. It makes it's easy to remember because he was betrayed on Wednesday, Spy Wednesday, and died on Friday. The reason why we're supposed to do this every Friday is because if Sunday is to be a mini Easter, then every Friday must also be a mini Good Friday. You see, it's one of those ways where you know how we, we kind of get irritated that Oftentimes people are, you know, they, they come maybe to Palm Sunday and then come back on Easter and it's, you know, Hosanna in the highest and he is risen and there's no passion. Well, we're called to do that every single week ourselves. We're guilty that ourselves if we do, you know, um, singing the resurrection praises of Jesus every Sunday, but forgetting he died on Friday. I would encourage you to find something that you really enjoy not something that's already bad for you. Giving up smoking for Lent is not the point. You probably should give up smoking anyway. Something that's good um, by every measure and deny yourself that. Don't make a show of it, but do it um, as an act of devotion. And then discover how difficult it is 
to give up the thing you really enjoy because it's good for you and it's meant to be good, but it's hard to, to not let it dominate us. I mean, it's always good maybe to be in conversation with someone about what you should give up, um, especially if it's new for you because you may, some, some things may be, may be harmful. Um, almsgiving, hopefully you're giving anyway to the work of the church, but above and beyond, is there a certain way that you can sacrifice, if you're, let's just say, for instance, you're giving 10% of your income and that's sacrificial enough, absolutely it is. All right, so 40 days, can you give 10.5% of your income or 11% of your income and add that one little bit, not astronomically more, but one little bit that just becomes an act of devotion. Devotion means um, from a vow, from an act of, um, of just, I mean, that, that, that feeling that we have in devotion of, because we love the Lord and we want to do it. And remember, don't make a show of it. Do it privately. Do it quietly. Do it, do it um, 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 anonymously. And then prayer. It's not that we should only pray during Lent but, and not pray the rest of the time. That's not how that works. In addition to what we're already doing, are there other devotions we can do, especially the ones that, that address our own brokenness, our need for penitence, examination of our sin, or devotions related to the cross of Jesus? Stations of the Cross is a great example. Luke and Kristen and Robert will be creating an audio version of the Stations of the Cross that you can have on your um, iPhone and listen wherever you are. If you're taking a walk, especially, gosh, it was spring today, wasn't it? If you're taking a walk, I drove home with the windows down. If you want to walk in the Greenway or walk in your neighborhood, but to listen to the Stations of the Cross as you're doing it is a great way to, to combine a kinetic activity with, with prayer. Um, so to find those kinds of devotions to deepen our understanding as to what we're doing will be another step to make it more meaningful. Um, but I will say also manage your expectations to the degree that we will fail. And I actually think that failing is almost the point because if we could do these simple things, fasting, almsgiving, and prayer, if we could do these simple things without any problem, we would start to really be puffed up with our own pride. But the simplest things, the simplest things that we're given, such a low bar is so hard because we need the grace of Jesus for everything, especially this. It's eight o'clock. Let me, let me open it up for any kind of comments or questions you may have. Change the view. Anybody? Okay. I looked up the Didache passage, and you were right. It says, um, the hypocrites fast on the second and fifth day of the week, but you should fast on the fourth day and the preparation day, Friday. Yeah. And the Didache is... <sighs> maybe the earliest non-biblical Christian document. Um, I think some would argue it may be as early as first century, but certainly second century. You can find it all online. It means the teaching, D-I-D-A-C-H-E. Okay, Marsha? Uh, this doesn't have to do with Lent, but I'll forget to ask you if I don't ask you now. And I won't hold your feet to the fire on this, but just give me your a guesstimate. Do you think there's any chance that we may get to do the readings this year that we always do starting on thir uh, Thursday night? The reading. Going through, going through to Friday, Good Friday. Oh, you, mean, you, mean the, you mean the prayer before the Blessed Sacrament? Yes, yes. Possibly. I, I don't know. Yeah, okay. It's possible. Part of it depends on what space is completed. Okay work it would be easier to do it in our completed space than doing it in drake hall mm -hmm. i don't think there's any issue in terms of covid at all it's just no. not, not now um but it's just in terms of, of the space we have available but if we can absolutely we'll do it okay
Anything else? Excellent. Good. So <laughs> here's one simple thing you can do, and we'll close with it, is that there are traditionally two seasons in the church year in which one prayer is given to be said every day of the season. Now, the modern prayer book doesn't say it as much, except on um, except in, in terms of Lent, but the first Sunday of Advent, that collect, is traditionally said every day in Advent. And then the corresponding penitential season, of course, is Lent, and the collect for Ash Wednesday is um, meant to be said every day. Now, our current prayer book says this collect with the corresponding psalms and lessons serves as the weekdays which follow, except otherwise appointed. I think people interpret that meaning from Wednesday until, until um, Saturday. But the old prayer books, all of them said to be said, every, including 1928, by the way, said to be said every day in the season of Lent. And that's our custom at St. Timothy's. And so I would encourage you, if you're looking for something to do devotionally, to say the call it for Ash Wednesday every day. And then before you know it, it will be um, committed to your memory. So we'll close with that prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made, and dost forgive the sins of all those who are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness may obtain of thee, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Good night, everybody.